Joe, thank you for sharing your story. Thanks for being involved. Thanks to all of our servant leaders. Thanks for the ways that you make this church happen, uh, not just on Sunday, but all throughout the week. And so we are so excited for what God is doing in and through you. My name's Kurt. If you're joining us here in the room or online, uh, so glad that you are here. Thanks for spending your Sunday with us. Uh, we are excited to be wrapping up uh, like Katie said, this series that we've been in for the entire month of August called Begin Again. And uh, as we are leaning into this new season that we're all collectively going through together, uh, it's been a lot, and yet God's Word has a lot to say about it. Uh, so I hope it's been helpful. We're going to dive in just a minute, but before uh, we do that, a couple things that we just wanted to share with you and then take a second to pray just for what's going on uh, in our world. But first is that we talked about this last week, but when you are generous and give to the mission of what God's doing here in Restoration Church, it allows us to participate and move those resources into you know beautiful ways throughout our world and here in San Diego uh, really quickly and effectively and allows us to go further faster as a group than we can individually. And we shared last week that we uh, were able to invest because of your generosity over $3,000 here locally as well as across the world. Uh, in Afghanistan, as well as in Haiti with the earthquake, and that we're prepared to do that again as uh, the hurricane struck uh, Louisiana again th this morning. Uh, they had a couple last year, and then obviously we all remember Katrina a couple years ago, and so there's going to be some massive need. And so I just want to let you know that as you give uh, to what God's doing here, immediately 10% of everything that comes in, we find a way to send it out of our building uh, into other places, other spaces around uh, our city and around the world that really, uh, you know, need the love of Jesus in a tangible way and that we get to be a part of that as a community. And so for those of you that give around here, I just want to say thank you that your generosity enables us to do that. Uh, if you want to participate, there's three easy ways you can do it. You can go to restorationchurchsd.com slash give. You can do that here in the building or if you're watching online, make it really simple. You can set up one time or reoccurring giving. That's how my family and I choose to do it. You can text any amount in the message, uh, you know, to 84321 on your cell phone. You'll get a text response back. You can choose Restoration Church as your giving destination, or you can give here in person or mail a check to our building. You can drop it in the giving boxes on your way out if you love the old school sound of paper hitting plastic. So uh, that's a couple ways that you guys can participate in that. But I really just want to say thank you. Uh, thank you for being such a generous church, especially through a crazy year. And let's just take a minute before we dive into the message, just pray for all that's going on uh, in our world, for what's happening in Kabul, for the families uh, that lost loved ones, both Afghani families as well as our brave servicemen and women, uh, many of whom were stationed here just north of us in Camp Pendleton. Let's pray for those that are in Louisiana and the surrounding Gulf areas that are bracing uh, and, and perhaps, you know, in, in the very throes of lots of fear uh, and natural disaster right now. So will you just pray with me? Would you just open your hands and say, God, would you do something that we can't do? So we're coming before you to, to do something uh, on our behalf. Let's pray together. God, thank you for the power of prayer, that, that prayer is not passive. Uh, it's not our last resort, but it's actually our first response when there's something that's bigger than us, which right now feels so common in our world as we watch the news, as our, our phones light up with alerts that seem all bad. Uh, God, we know that you actually hold the world in your hands, and that song that perhaps we learned as a child ha has new meaning as an adult, even though it might be hard to believe at times. And so we, we come as best we can to you and say, God, I don't know what's going on. I don't know why this is happening. The, the grief, the panic, the fear, the, the chaos, the disaster that we're seeing unfold abroad and on our shores. God, would you, would you just be in that space? Would you be whatever those people need for you to be in this now moment? Thank you, God, that your interaction with us isn't, you know, it isn't a, a one-size-fits-all. It's tailor-made. And so for people that need, need courage, would you give them courage? That people that need healing and comfort, would you give them healing and comfort? For those that need protection, would you protect them? And for those that you're going to use this in, in your mysterious way to draw them to, to find you, God, thank you that even in the darkest moments, as we just sang, we can, we can find you in the quiet. We can find you in the pain. So we don't understand it all, but, but we come before you saying we, we are out of options, but we know that you are holding it, and so we trust you as best we know how, and we ask for your presence. And I know that that's not just a prayer for across the world, but even here in this room. God, this morning people are walking in with fear or with financial struggle or with loss of a loved one or with just grief or, or confusion. I pray that you would meet us in a powerful way. 
this morning through our time together as community, through your word, and through our worship. And so God, be here with us this morning. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, again, I'm so glad that you're here. And if you're joining us for the first time, uh, like, like Katie said, we are concluding a series. This is how we teach around here. So we kind of you know, take an idea, talk about it for as, as long as it makes sense, usually you know, four to ten weeks. Uh, and then when, we, when I run out of things to say or whatever, uh, we stop talking about it and move on. So this past series, we've looked at the life of Elijah. Uh, we're going to talk about today the end of Elijah's life and his protege, Elisha. So it's very confusing. If you get mixed up, I'll probably mess it up and, and, and interchange them. So we're all in this together. But through this series, uh, we learned in the first week that even when we are forgetful, we can, re- we can rest knowing that God is actually faithful, and that empowers us to actually reimagine a better future, which is good news in this season. We learned in the second week that both fear and faith require that you believe in something that you can't see. That to, to step forward in faith or to step forward in fear requires that you believe that there's something that you can't see that's out there. And so we get to choose which direction we're going to go. And so we decided to choose to restore what was broken. We learned that greatness in the kingdom of God doesn't depend on our ability. It actually depends on our availability. Uh, and so a couple weeks ago, we said, God, let's, let's pray and end our prayers with the statement of God, here am I, send me. In whatever space and capacity that might be, God, I'm going to be willing to show up. I'm going to re-engage with courage. And then as Michael mentioned, we, we talked last week that it's so easy for us to miss out on what God is doing uh, in this now moment because we want it to look like it used to look. We want it to look like it was before. And so even in spaces that are challenging or confusing or disorienting, uh, that we can actually lean into what God wants to do right now, even if it looks different when we prioritize his presence and sometimes that means getting quiet. And so today, like I said, we're going we're gonna to get to the end of Elijah's life. It's a pretty quick story, actually, uh, for how much action happens in it, which I love because ADD. Uh, and so I kind of love getting through those Bible stories that are quick and full of excitement. And we get to the point where he's going to pass off his life and his legacy to Elisha. So he's literally going to entrust someone else to begin again with what God has led him to. And so in case you have to leave early or you fall asleep or your internet goes out, for those of you watching online, I'm going to give you the kind of big question that we're going to wrestle with today right up front, all right? Because this is going to be so important. And that's the question of as we all lean into this new, new life, this new phase of life that we're in, this new season of life, as we kind of reemerge into the world and we kind of restart our own life in so many different ways, the question I want us to ask this morning is what are you really committed to? Like, like when you think about it, what are you really committed to? And, and how do you know? How do you know? What, what are you willing to kind of let go of or leave or, or not pursue to actually hold on to that thing that you're committed to? And, and if you're here and you're kind of exploring Jesus, maybe you've come back to church through this last month or so, you joined our church for the first time in the last month or so, and you're kind of checking out God or you're kind of coming back to God after you know, being a long time away, I, I want to give you the opportunity today before we're done together to actually commit to following Jesus in an all-in, no-turning-back kind of way because he actually went all-in for you. And if you're here and you say, I I am a follower of Jesus, I have committed my life to to love and follow him the best I know how, I want to challenge you to ask and answer the question, who in your life is going to be following Jesus because you're following Jesus? If you've been around, you've heard me ask that question a lot because I think that's the crux of the, the idea of being an apprentice, of being a disciple of Jesus, is that other people are following Jesus because I'm following Jesus. So for us to ask that question, who is that? Because let's be honest, after the last 18 months of quarantine, where we were so undercommitted in a lot of ways, because, you know, it was like, what do I do with all of this time? Uh, I'm, I'm bored. And then all of a sudden things got crazy. I had to pivot and all this, all this stuff. And then over these last few months, if you're anything like me, as life has kind of reemerged and the restaurants are open again, you can go out, you can see the Padres actually do well, which is awesome, right? You can actually like step into new spaces in life, right? And, and now all of a sudden I've found, maybe you've felt this as well, that I'm quickly overcommitted. Like life feels very full and very busy all of a sudden. And my fatigue is still not totally, you know, remedied from all of that we've gone through the last year and a half. And so I have never stopped. And maybe you have this way either. I have never stopped to ask myself, even though I've come straight out of quarantine from being undercommitted to finding myself quickly overcommitted, I've never stopped to ask, what do I actually want to commit my time and energy and life to? Like there's gonna be a lot of questions. A lot of people want to hang out with a lot of opportunities. 
what do I actually want to commit my time and my energy and my life to? And so to give us some context for this, we're going to turn to the scripture. So if you have a Bible, you can turn to 1 Kings 19. If you're here, you can grab the Bible that's in the seat back pocket directly in front of you, and it's on page 216. It's kind of where we're going to pick up, starting in verse 19, again, of 1 Kings chapter 19. So it's in here, two, I'm sorry, 214 uh, in the Blue Bible, or you can open another tab if you're watching online. And again, this is the end of Elijah's life, right? After this little section of the story, things kind of go quickly onto the next scene. And and this is really, really important because how many of you know this, that how you end, how you finish is often how you're remembered. If if you've left a job or you've moved from a city or you've had a relationship coming in, how that relationship ends is often how that relationship or that job or that interaction is remembered. And so as we look to Elijah's life, he's had this incredible story with so much action and so much energy. And here's where we're going to find his life kind of comes to an end. All right, so 1 Kings chapter 19, starting in verse 19. It said, so Elijah went and found Elisha, son of Shepheth, plowing in a field. And there were 12 teams of oxen in that field, and Elisha was plowing the 12th team. So translation, Elisha's rolling, okay? Like many of us are not farmers. I don't plow oxen often. I had to actually look this up. 12, you know, yoke of oxen is a lot of oxen, like 24 bulls, all right? So he's plowing, and he's on the last team. He probably has servants working in front of him on the other oxen, plowing this huge field to need that many oxen. And Elijah went over to him and throws his cloak across his shoulders and then turns and walks away. So this is kind of like uh, an Old Testament mic drop situation, right? He walks up into this guy that's like rich and he's he's doing his work. He's doing the family business. And he says, guess what? God has a different plan for your life. I'll see you later, right? And he just kind of pieces out. And Elijah's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And again, we don't understand this if we're not raised in a Jewish context, right? But this is a big, big deal, especially after the last few years that they've had where Elijah has become a pretty, Elijah has become a, see, I told you I would do it. Elijah has become a pretty big deal because of how he stood up to the king in the midst of this drought. And so Elisha says to Elijah, he knows exactly what he's asking to do. He's asking him to come be his apprentice, be his protege. He says, hey, first, let me go kiss my father and mother goodbye, and then I will go with you. And Elijah says, go on back. But remember, think about what I have done to you, right? Think about what I've invited you into. Because I have to understand, Elisha's, he's living the good life. He's running the family business. He's in charge. He has power. He has prominence. He has wealth. But but in this moment, there's an invitation from God away from comfort into courage, away from just having power into purpose. And Elisha realizes this is something he has to do. But listen to what he does next. This is so powerful. And so Elisha returns to his oxen that he's plowing the field with, slaughters them, uses the wood from the plow to build a fire, and then he throws the biggest neighborhood barbecue they've ever seen. Right? He slaughters the cow, he burns the plows, he cooks the meat, he feeds the entire town, says they all ate, and then he goes to be with Elijah as his assistant. I mean, think about this. He's leaving being the CEO of Shepheth Farms, right, to become a prophet's servant. I don't, I don't know about you, but, but that seems like a pretty remarkable and, and miraculous moment. And I don't know if you've ever had those moments where you recognize that that God is actually inviting you to do something that doesn't make sense, but you just have to do it. There's just something in your soul that's screaming, there's more than what I have. I need meaning more than materialism. I want purpose instead of power. I don't want to just live for myself. I want to leave a legacy. And for us today, as we read the story, if we're honest, most of us, we're, we're not in danger of ruining our life. Like, we're always a couple of decisions away and we can get in a really dark place pretty quick, right? Amen, like anybody else besides just me, okay? We, we all know that that's possible, but that's not really our biggest risk. Our biggest risk isn't ruining our life. Often our biggest risk can be wasting our life. And I think especially coming out of this season when everything's slowed down and now everything feels so unstable, it's so easy to want to waste our life in the name of safety, or in the name of fear, or the name of just concern and wait and see and all the things that we've talked about in this series. And so the man of God comes, and and Elisha's just working in the field. He puts his cloak over him. That's the symbol of saying, I want you to come and follow me. 
right? Not dissimilar from uh, a, a Nazarene, you know, carpenter that would come to fishermen and say, I want you to come and follow me. I'm going to teach you how to fish for people instead of just fish for salmon and trout, right? I want to, I want to change the direction of your life. And you're actually going to change history when you say yes. And, and this is what happens. And so Elisha says his goodbyes, but then he burns the plows and slaughters the oxen. I mean, this is a bold move where he literally takes away any temptation for himself of returning to his old life. He, he says, there, there's no going back. I don't know if his parents were like really upset or thrilled or proud. I don't know, right? Parent, parenting can be weird. You're like, wow, this is so powerful. But also, what did you do to all of my property? You know, you have, you have this moment where you can wonder what, what they're thinking. But clearly, he's made his mind up. And, and he's literally all in. Everything he has is now gone. He says, I am going to follow Elijah. And the Apostle Paul writes later in the New Testament, he says, actually, this is, this is actually the invitation for all of us. And so often, if I'm honest, I, I want Jesus to be an add-on. I want morality to be something I tack on to my life. But Paul says, actually, when, when you want to follow Jesus, when you're in Christ, your old life is crucified with him. The, the, the old us is buried and gone, and we are raised into new life. And, and yet for so many of us, we can get so stuck in old patterns and old habits of our old life. And I think that's why it's so hard for us to move forward is because we keep trying to cling to what was. Or, or maybe you're here and you're kind of checking out, God, if you were honest, you were, you're skeptical of Christians and you're skeptical of Jesus because all the people you know that say they follow Jesus, they're still holding on to their old life and their old pattern. And it doesn't look like Jesus had made much of a difference. And so I, I get that. And if I had your same experiences, I'd probably believe the same thing that you do. But here's what's so powerful about the story is that Jesus is never meant to be an add-on in our life. And Elisha shows us that. The call is to give up the old so you can embrace the new that God wants to give you. And so this morning, I think it's valuable for us to ask the question, whether you've been following Jesus for a long time or this, is, this whole thing is new for you, is to ask, is there a deeper level of surrender that perhaps God is inviting you into? I know life might be good, or maybe life is crazy, but, but there might be a deeper level of surrender right now that God wants from you in order for you to experience all that he has in store for you. Because the ticket, so to speak, for Elisha to get what he wanted in his life, the, the meaning and the purpose, the things that all of our souls crave, was actually the pathway of surrender. And so Elisha totally, you know, said the old life is gone. It's literally burned and fed to the townspeople. And, and this obvious story of mentorship, I think is such a beautiful picture of what it actually means to be an apprentice of Jesus. Like I said, when we talk about discipleship, we can lose what that means in sort of like a religious connotation. But really all, all it means is apprenticeship. It means discipleship. It means protege. That, that I'm going to follow Jesus and go, what's he going to do? That, that's how I'm going to do it. How does Jesus treat people not like me? That's how I'm going to treat people not like me. What does Jesus say about money? That's, that's how I'm going to do my money. I, I don't get it. It doesn't make sense. It's really, really difficult, but that's what my, that's what my leader does. So I'm his protege. I'm going to tell him I'm going to do it. What does Jesus say we should do in our relationships? That's how I'm going to do relationships. Who did Jesus say that I am, even though all the voices in my head and all the voices out in social media in my life tell me otherwise? That's actually what I'm going to believe, even though it might be difficult. This is what it means to follow Jesus. That no matter what our faults are, no matter what our challenges are, that you and I have been invited to be a protege, an apprentice of the Son of God, right as you are. Just like that song we sang at the beginning this morning. The, uh, Elisha probably didn't feel worthy. He probably didn't have all his questions answered right away. We, we clearly see that he still has some business to take care of, but he knew that this was an invitation that he had to say yes to. This was something he needed to commit to. And we're going to notice in just a moment in the story, that commitment grows deeper and deeper and deeper. And the life that Elijah is offering Elisha gets more and more beautiful and accessible through the continued surrender. So if you're in the scriptures, flip over to 2 Kings, just a couple of pages, chapter 2. If you have this Bible right in front of you, again, it's on page uh, 220, 219, 220. Uh, we're going to go from one page to the next. So in 2 Kings chapter 2, we continue in the story, and most scholars believe this is about six years later. So again, Elisha goes from being CEO of the family business to the servant, the apprentice, the protege, the unpaid intern, if you will, of the man of God for six years. Six years. And then we get to this moment 
right? Starting in, in verse six. And so Elijah said to Elisha, stay here. The Lord has told me to go across the Jordan River, right? This is enemy territory. But Elisha replied, as surely as the Lord lives, and in case that's too ethereal, as surely as you live, I will never leave you. Like I'm, I'm committed. I'm, I'm here to the end. So they went on together. And then I love that the, the narrator of the story, you know, says, you know, I'm sure in a Scottish accent, 50 men, right? Braveheart? No, okay. 50 men from the group of prophets also went and watched from a distance. They weren't willing to go, but they were eyewitnesses that this actually happened. And Elijah and Elisha stopped by, beside the Jordan River. Elijah folded up his cloak, the same cloak that he had put on Elisha to call him to follow him. He takes it off, folds it up, and he strikes the water, and it says the river divided, and the two of them walked across on dry land. Again, this is something that we've seen God do before, if you know the story of Israel. When they come to the other side, right, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me what I can do for you before I am taken away. So here's this moment, right, where Elisha says to Elijah, hey, I know what you might be heading into might be difficult, but, but when I said I would follow you, I meant it. When I said you can count on me, I was being honest. I, I didn't know all the details, but when I said yes, it meant yes no matter what. And again, Elijah's cloak has been a symbol, right, for this younger man to follow him into the plans that God has for him. But rather than saying, ooh, I really want those plans to be, like, helpful and easy and, and preferably the speed of a microwave, right? Which is how I usually want to pursue life, right? Love it to be helpful, love it to be easy, and quickly would be ideal. Instead, it's six years of, of quiet. There's not a lot in that chapter and a half that we flipped past that talks about what Elijah and Elisha did. But what we do know is it got to the point where Elijah could trust Elisha to say, hey, I'm going to go forward and it's not going to be easy. So you can, you can stay here and I'll come back. But Elijah, even though he had trusted Elisha's faith in him, Elisha's faith in Elijah had also grown in the process. He says, actually, I'm, I'm following you no matter what. We're going to go into enemy territory. You're not going in alone. Right? And, and this is a beautiful picture because we're going to see in just a minute that this moment when they passed through the Jordan River because of the cloak, this was a baton pass moment. And the question for us is, what are the things that maybe God wants to entrust to you that you're trying to earn but instead, what he's trying to say is, would you surrender? Are there things that God wants for you that you have to surrender in order to gain? It's backwards. It doesn't make sense in our Western world, but it actually works in our life. You're trying so hard to get that job, and instead, you, want, you need to surrender. Hey, God, would you lead me to the place that you want me to go? You're trying so hard to get that relationship, and yet every turn you, you take, it kind of seems like it's getting worse. God, would you, would you surrender to God your relationship and actually do the work that maybe he's inviting you to do. For many of us, when it comes to our faith, right, we, we want the rewards of following Jesus, but we, we don't want the responsibility. And for many of us, for many of us, when we will press beyond the struggles of the day-to-day, -day, whether that's the fear of failure or the, or the pain of monotony, there is a peace on the other side that comes through that pressure. Because, don't miss this, from God's vantage point, success is always about developing a successor in every area of your life. Parents, you get this. Your faith is most beautifully manifest in the faith of your children. Even at your work, not just spiritually speaking, right? Your best success is in empowering and developing a team. If you're a teacher, one, you're a hero and we love you. But secondly, that's your whole life, right? Is that you're trying to impart the wisdom that you have to these kindergartners or these high school students or these college students, right? Success in God's perspective, and we get this, and we just we just miss it because America has told us it's it's financial or it's power or it's or it's prestige, but actually success is always in developing a successor. And when you follow Jesus, you have to understand this. Jesus is always looking who's behind you. Who's behind you? So often I want to think, oh yeah, Jesus is looking to me. He is, but he's also looking who's behind me. Who's following Jesus because I'm following Jesus. And, and this is what's so powerful, right? Just as Elisha pursued Elijah as his apprentice, we are to pursue Jesus as his protégés. And when he invites people to follow him, that means we should be inviting people to follow him as well. Like I said, this is ultimately what discipleship means. And if we really were to get that, it would become a game changer for most of us with our faith. 
I'm going to read you a passage that is probably terrifying, but it's from the words of Jesus, so I, I'm going with it. In John 14, 12, John, his best friend, records Jesus saying, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works that I have done. Comma. It means there's more to the story. And even greater works because I'm leaving you to go with the Father. Like, imagine if we actually believed that. Jesus when he walked on the planet. If I were to really believe that, I would probably go, I, uh, I might have some work to do. Don't you think? And that we're even invited and perhaps expected to do greater works than Jesus because we have the power of the Holy Spirit. I mean, that causes me to look at my life and ask some real questions. And this, this has nothing to do with shame. This is an invitation to being empowered by God. It's what your soul craves. And, and we learn in moments like this, we learn in the statements of Jesus, we learn in the life of Elijah that it is actually the small decisions that no one sees that produces the results that everyone wants. Elisha said, yeah, I'll keep going. And so he got what the rest of the people that were watching from afar didn't get. There's spaces in your life when, when, when you buckled down and said, I, this is going to hurt, this is going to cost money, this is a risk, but I, I'm going to make the hard decisions for my company, for our family, in my faith. I'm, I'm going to do the thing that no one sees. There's no one's going no to thank you for doing that. No one's going to thank you for being faithful. No one's going to thank you for saving money. No one's going to thank you for pushing forward and not taking a salary so you can pay the rest of your employees. No one's going to thank you for those small decisions. But it's the small decisions that no one sees that build the life, that produce the results that everyone actually wants. But in the social media age, we just go, oh, it's overnight success. But beautiful things don't happen overnight. They happen over time. And this is what Elisha's story shows us, that for six years in obscurity, he follows, he serves. And that's what actually leads to him becoming the greatest prophet in the story of Israel that they'd ever seen. When you start from a posture of surrender, the only place you can go is up. And don't, don't miss that. When you start from a posture of surrender, the only place you can go is up. And so if we want, if you want in your life things that others don't have, you have to be willing to do other th things that other people won't do. If you want what others, you know, things that others won't get, you have to do things that others won't do. And that's true in every area of our life. And if we understood this as a church, if we understand this in our own lives, if we understood this in our marriages, in our companies, in our parenting, if we understood that pressure produces something, that, that pain actually can produce peace for others, that we, we would actually stand the strain much longer. I love this quote from Dallas Willard because maybe you're thinking, well, yeah, but what about, what about grace and what about how this works? And I don't want to like earn my salvation. That, that feels rough. And that, that's not at all what I'm talking about. What I am saying is there's a cost to following Jesus. And he says this, he says, grace is opposed to earning, but it is not opposed to effort. Grace is opposed to, to earning. You, there's nothing you and I can do to make God love you more than he does right now, even if your weekend was crazy, right? There is nothing you can do to make God love you more or love you less. Thank you. I'm glad that worked. But that does not mean that this is just a lean back, kick it up, and be like, cool, taken care of. But that's not what following means. Religion says, yeah, come sit once a month, give a little. When you feel bad, check the box, you're good. That ain't the mission on the wall out there, friends. That's not the church we're going to be. I'm gonna love and follow Jesus. That means every day I have to take a step. Every day I wake up and go, oh, Lord, give me your grace and mercy because I got some work to do. I am imperfect. I am still growing. And I know, Jesus, you're still moving. And so if I stop and you keep going, the gap between us grows, and that's not your fault, that's mine. So if I'm going to love and follow Jesus, there is 
effort to put in. There is commitment that is required. Right? And this is powerful for us because if we understood this, if we grasped that, if we took hold of that promise of Jesus that you are actually, if you are following me, you are going to do the things that I have done, the things you've seen, and you're going to do even greater things without me, which we're going to study in the book of Acts over the next 10 weeks. Right? That actually happened. But that isn't just biblical history. That's a prophetic promise for your life, your company, your neighborhood, your family, your classroom, your marriage, your darkest doubt and addiction. Jesus says, there's more. There's more for you. But so often, if we're honest, we are sidetracked and preoccupied by the things that we have yet to give God permission to play with. Let's be honest. The reason that I don't see great things happening in my life and my faith, that perhaps the reason that you don't see God showing up in your life the way that you want to is because there are areas of our life, there are capacities in our life, there are certain spaces of your marriage, your finances, your faith, your story, your schedule. You said, God, you, you can take everything but not that. <laughs> you don't have permission to play there because I know you're going to mess it up and I'm not interested <laughs> And I get that tension, friends. I do. But that's what's so challenging and so inspiring about Elisha's story. He burns the plows. He slaughters the auction. He says, there's no going back. I'm I'm the definition of all in. And when he follows Elijah across the river and he sees his cloak separate the waters and make a way, when Elisha goes up to heaven in a fiery, you know, know, ascension, it's, it's an incredible story. And his cloak is the only thing that's left behind. The symbol of his call for Elisha, the thing that was going to pass on his legacy is the only thing that's left behind. I love that imagery. Elisha picks it up. He goes back to the river, the same river he had just crossed moments before with his mentor, with his leader. Now he's alone, right? Now he's here by himself and the protege has become the leader. The apprentice has become the master. Wax on, wax off. And he takes the cloak and he strikes the water and he says, where is the God of Elijah? I think it's so honest. He doesn't take it on and goes, yeah, I'm the man now. Check it out. <laughs> That's what I would do, right? But he goes, no, 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 no. This, I still need to believe that what I've followed mattered. I still need to believe that what I gave my life to made a difference. I don't have the courage to do it on my own yet. I've been an apprentice. I'm still stepping into this new role. So where's the God of Elijah? And he strikes the water. And the Bible says that 50 people that were waiting on the other side see the water separate again. And Elisha comes back on his own and the score rises and it's this beautiful "Ah!" moment. (laughs) But I'm sure inside Elisha was still mourning, still unsure. His voice might still be a little shaky, but he knew what he was committed to. He knew he was committed to following And his time and his life watching Elijah didn't make him Elijah, even though their names rhymed, but it gave him the confidence to be fully himself and to step into what God had called him to do. And for some of you this morning, there is someone, and and you feel it in your soul, and you can feel your chest tightening because the Holy Spirit is telling you there is someone that is watching you, and you know it. And the question is, if they lived their life just like you, would their, would their life be better? Not perfect. You're not perfect. That's okay. But would it lead them to their own version of their destiny, their own story with God, because they saw your example? I think this is, this is so powerful, but, but it's not going to come without giving God permission to play with our whole life, to, to show up to say, God, I'm actually... I'm making a decision. You don't have to, but if if you're going to say, I'm committed to following Jesus, I'm going to commit to all the way following Jesus in every area of my life. Because we all have spaces that there's things that we want, but our unwillingness to trust God in those moments hold us back. They hold us back. And it's the little things that we have decided or not decided to do that are producing the results. And so when we say, oh, I want to, I mean, here's a couple examples. I want to live without stressing about money. Everybody wants that, right? I want to live without stressing about money. But I don't know if I want to budget now to live below my means. It's the small decisions that no one sees 
that produce the results that everybody wants. I want to have a great marriage one day. Whether you're married or single, I want to have a great marriage one day. But do you settle for anyone who seems interested at any given moment? I mean, I want my kids to grow up to love and follow Jesus. But this one stings because when I look at my family calendar, it shows that God has some competition. Right? Gosh, church can be so clicky and closed-minded. I wish they would find someone kind to serve at the front door or talk to people they don't already know, but I'll just wait here, right? I wish we would give more to help our city and respond to all these things going on in the world. The world seems to be on fire every turn, but I'm not going to give more than required. I mean, we have all these moments, right, that, that, that really it's so easy for us to go, what about this, without saying, what about me? And this is the model, the entire life of Elijah as a life well-lived and well-invested. And of Elisha, his protege, it says, I'm going I'm to choose to live a surrendered life knowing that that leads to a full life. I mean, I mean this is the example that God gives for us. And so as we, as we wrap up this series, my, my, encourage to, my encouragement to you is this, whether you're watching online or whether you're here in the room, as we each begin again in whatever sphere or space that you're in, wherever that might be for you in this moment, my encouragement is this. In a world that loves options, will you opt to go all in? In a world that loves options, let's opt to go all in, whatever that looks like for you. For some of you, that's with your finances. For some of you, that's in your marriage to choose. Hey, you know what? I'm not giving up on this. For some of you, it's with your schedule. You need, you need to go, hey, there's a million things coming at me. I need to decide what's the most important. For some of you, I believe this morning, it is going all in with Jesus. It said, I've been around church. I'm familiar with some of the stories. But if I'm really, really honest this morning, as I look at this story in the scriptures, I have certainly not burned the plows of my old life. For some of you, you're, you're checking on God for the first time in a long time, and it's been through devastating pain and loss in your life that God's gotten your attention. And I want you to know it's not manipulative. It's because he cares about you so much that he will actually lead you someplace you wouldn't go on your own to show and to prove his faithfulness to you. And so the question is, have you, have I, have we burned the plows in our life so that we can pick up the mantle of love and leadership of Jesus in our life? Because if I'm busy pushing the plow, I can't pick up his mantle. If I'm busy doing my old thing, if I'm busy doing the thing that just made sense, it worked for me, I don't have room to take hold of what God has that might be new. And so in the quietness of our own hearts this morning, I, I want to invite you to really consider that question. What are you committed to? For some of you, I, I believe that this might be the moment that you decide, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give Jesus a chance for the first time or, or, or again. And so God... I don't know what that looks like, but, but here's me. For, for some of you, this last year and a half has broken your faith. And I get that. I, I, really, I mean, I do this professionally, and there's days that I'm like, God, is this, like, is this real? Like, is this a thing? And for some of you, maybe this is the moment to go, there, there's been a lot going on, but I'm ready to recommit and for some of you, there's perhaps a space in your life where there is something and you've wanted me to be done for the last 35 minutes because the Holy Spirit is saying, it's time to have a barbecue. And it's time to get rid of that. It's time to come clean. It's time to empty the cabinet. It's time to be honest. It's time to say no to that opportunity because you know it is taking you away from what you actually want to be committed to. And so in the moment, I'm going to give us just a quiet space. And, and I believe for all of us, no matter where you're at, you, you have an opportunity, if you want it, to give God a little bit more commitment today. And I believe he will meet you in that and bless you in that, and that your life will be different because of it, that the small thing that perhaps no one sees will be the beginning, it'll be the catalyst moment to build the life and create the results that you've ultimately wanted for a long time. And so I know that there's a million reasons to pass up this moment. 
So I just want to invite you to get quiet for a second, to, to close your eyes, to open your hands. In whatever way that the Spirit is leading, would you just be willing, would you be open to feel God like Elijah put his cloak around Elijah to say, God, you're, you're inviting me into something. It's not instantaneous. Transformation always is a process. But I know it begins by me saying yes. So as best I know how, I want to say yes. For some of you, this is your moment to actually decide to start following Jesus. You've been putting it off. You've been, you've been saying, I'm, I'm good enough, or I got questions still. Great. I believe if you follow Jesus, your questions will be met along the journey because this is not a moment where everything is settled. This is the beginning of a journey, a beginning of an adventure. And all the reasons that you've put up in your brain of why you, you're not qualified or you're not good enough, I believe all of those are valid, but Jesus doesn't care. He offers you the invitation anyways because he's that good. So we don't have to be. And so if that's you this morning, would you just in the quietness of your own heart repeat this simple prayer after me? Jesus, I want to be your protege. I want to be your apprentice. I got baggage. I got doubt. I got junk. But since you've invited me, since you've already told me, that you love me through your death and resurrection. Today, I commit as best I know how to love and follow you. Help me to trust you enough to let go of my old life so I have space to receive the new life that you offer me. For some of you, this is a moment to come back perhaps to the faith of your childhood or the faith that has been so strained and tested because you thought you had to do it on your own. I want to remind you, grace is not about earning. But it does require effort. It does require commitment. And so perhaps for you today, the prayer is, God, there's, there's something in my life I know you're asking me to let go of. And I don't want to. But I believe with your help, you can empower me too. So please, I want to recommit my life to you today afresh. Will you help me to live the way you've invited me to? That I want to watch how you do it. I'm done with religion, but I want to begin following you again. And if you prayed either of those prayers, I just want to let you know this is such an incredible moment in your life. It feels simple. It feels ordinary. But the Holy Spirit of God is here. And if that is your prayer today, he is moving in your life. So I just want to pray for you before we go. God, for my friends here, for those watching online, I pray that you would empower and inspire us to leave what we need to leave behind so that we can press on to the future that you have for us unhindered. And that is scary and brave and courageous, but that is the adventure that you call us on. So God, we are done. We are done with additive Jesus. We don't, him, we don't want him just to be an option like a cell phone bonus or something we add to our car. God, would you take it all. You know, there's no going back. I'm done with the small way of living. I want to step into the greatness that you might have for me, the beauty you have in my future, but I know that posture requires surrender. And so for my friends here this morning, 
decided to follow you, that gave their life back to you, that recommitted their life to you. What a beautiful thing for us to celebrate. We know that all of heaven is rejoicing, not only just because of our decision, but because ultimately it all comes back to you, Jesus, that you gave your life on the cross for us so that we never have to doubt where we stand with you. And so our celebration is worship. So it's in your name we pray all these things. Amen and amen. What we do, we want to join heaven and celebrate that perhaps you made that decision today. And if you're here in the room, grab that card. It's in the seat back pocket and, and let us know. Let us know. Just fill out your name. Check that box that you decided to follow Jesus today. It's on the what's next side. Uh, if you're watching online, uh, you can also go to restorationchurchsd.com slash new. Check that box to fill out that same card for us and let us know so we can get in touch with you. We just want to celebrate and encourage you. We want to give you resources and answer questions and actually invite you to join us as we love and follow Jesus together. We are imperfect at it, but we are doing the best we can. And it's so much better and so much more fun to go on this journey as a community. So let us know that so we can connect with you this week. And then before we wrap up, we just want to sing a last few songs to really seal this moment, to sing out this anthem that we're not, we're not going back. That there's spaces in your life that maybe a small decision you made today is going to change the trajectory of your whole entire marriage, your whole entire business, your whole entire story. And it's because you've decided to say yes to Jesus. And so we want to invite you to stand if you're able. We're going to sing these songs out. And as we worship, as we close out, our prayer team is available. And we just want to encourage you. Perhaps you've made that decision. We want to know about it. You can let us know. We can pray and speak the name of Jesus over you. Perhaps you came in today and life's been so challenging this week because of what you've seen on the news. If you're here and you're a service member, we want to pray for you. Right? We don't want to call you out. We just want to pray for you because I can't imagine what you're going through, that your brothers and sisters in arms are in harm's way and that so many lives were lost this week. Would you let us pray for you? Would you go back and just take a moment? You don't say anything. We just want to pray for you. Maybe you're in a season of transition or this whole series has spoken to something in your life. We believe that prayer moves the heart of God and moves us closer to the heart of God. So don't miss this moment. So you stand. We're going to sing. We're going to worship. We're going to pray as we close out our time together. Thank you so much for being here with us this morning.